ladies and gentlemen. Um, the surprise to me is not so much that the euro is falling apart at the moment. That was, I think, always to be expected. It was always to be forecast. Anybody who looked at the history of such things had forecast that. The surprise to me instead is that the supporters of the euro, those who pushed the, the project, seem so reluctant to admit that it's failed. I mean, what is the matter with them? What do they, what do they think failure would be that if it hasn't already occurred? I, I, um, the history of, 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 of currency blocks is, is fairly straightforward. Um, there has, this is my, my analysis anyway, but there, there's never been a currency block in the history of the universe Oh, sorry. Oh, right, so, so, so we can't, we can't. Okay. Um, the, um, the system, as, as, um, the um, currency blocks, as far as I'm concerned, have, have never worked unless there's been political union. Um, Sterling area works because it was political union. The Russian Federation, the Soviet Union, worked because there was political union. As soon as countries left, the political union, the currency thing went wrong. And, uh, and that was inevitable as far as I was concerned. Um, if you didn't have political union in Europe, then of course you weren't going to have currency union. The issue was to me, did the proponents of the euro system not know that? Were they so stupid as not to know that? Unlikely. They're mostly fairly clever people. Not nice people, but in fact clever. <laughs> or did they know it and want to use it to create political union? Did they know that they couldn't have political union straight away because the people wouldn't accept it? Did they therefore go for monetary union, currency union, knowing that it was going to fail, knowing there was going to be a crisis, and hoping to use the crisis to achieve political union? Yes, almost certainly. Of course, we, 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 we Brits, especially we English, told them all about this ages ago, and of course, got, we got, we got, um, <laughs> we managed to annoy them substantially by doing so. Well, that was that was a big plus, but 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 actually, it didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't really actually help. Um, I also said to them, and, and this again, sort of history is, is very good on this. If, if you want, if you want to achieve currency union, what you should do is make sure that the countries that are the weakest members of the group come in at a high, at an uncomfortably high exchange rate. And that, in fact, the strong members come in at a low one. Why? Because the pendulum of advantage and disadvantage swings backwards and forwards. And you want to make sure that the guys actually who are disadvantaged overall take the pain early and the joy later because if you take the joy early and the pain comes later the psychology of the guys will not be sufficient to be able to withstand the pain and that demonstrably i would argue is what happened but i will give you two two splendid examples of this and the most recent one of course is when the East and West Germans, the Austes and the Westes, actually joined, the Austes came in at an exchange rate which was ludicrously high in many respects. I don't know how high in percentage terms. It might have been double, might even be more than double the rate it should have been. It made them ludicrously uncompetitive. But the West Germans, the generous creatures that they are, extended enormous quantities of finance year after year after year to the Austes or well, actually insulting them pretty roundly at the same time. And the Austes put their heads down, took the money, put, cap put it into capital spending, raised their productivity faster, one and a quarter, one and a half percentage points faster than the West is, took pay settlements which were lower than the guys in the West, and reduced the competitiveness gap year after year after year. When they first joined, when you first had monetary union, there were screams of agony coming out of the East because they were so uncompetitive. These days, there are relatively few screams. What you're getting now, I suspect, is something close to competitiveness. They've taken the pain 
the joy is beginning to come through. And it might be the case that if that momentum continues, it might be the case that this, what it's worth is my forecast, that the Eastern letter will be the motor of growth in Germany in the next 40 or 50 years. Example number two, England, Scotland, 1707, Union with Harold. A royal union before, but the real union began in 1707. It was done principally for military and religious reasons. The economics was an afterthought. The poor old Scots had a very tough time of it. They came in with the English monetary system, the English pound, at a time when both economies were largely agricultural. The Scots being largely in the Arctic Circle, and mostly mountains anyway. Um, and it really couldn't compete. Of course they couldn't. Uh, and of course they had a terrible time. You read Abbey Burns and it's, um, it's full, of, full, of, full of pain and suffering because of the economic circumstances. What the Scots had to do was find something they could do better than the English, better than the rest of Europe. It took some time. It took 20, 30, 35, 40 years. But goodness me, they succeeded in the end. They came up with engineering. They came up with finance. They invented so many aspects of the modern financial world, insurance companies and investment trusts and so on. They came up with an enormous number of very successful operations. And by the time you get to the 18, sorry, the 1770s, they're growing much more quickly than England. Much more quickly. Point and a half per, we don't know this for certain, but probably a point per annum faster. And by the time you get through to 1790, 1800, it's probably true that Lowland Scots' income per head are higher than the income per head of any part of England apart from London. Tremendous success. Of course, they threw it all away the second half of the 19th century. They're now sort of a Trotskyite country, but in fact, for a while, they were brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Pain first, joy later. That's the way to play it. Did the Europeans not know this? They must have known it, but they, the arrogance of the people is such that they thought they didn't have to obey the rules. They thought just by telling people how to do things, by political will, they could achieve whatever they wanted to do. Well, the economics has failed. And the, um, the politics is failing, I would suggest. And it's going to fail. I mean, how do they think it can succeed? These poor Greeks, what do they think is going on there? The Greeks, in my analysis, have got a level of competitiveness which is 15% um, 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 too high relative to say to the Germans. I don't know if that number's accurate, but it's all that sort of general order. Now, that wouldn't be so bad. You, you couldn't live with levels of uncompetitiveness, probably of that sort of order, without, without, without terrible problems. You get slow growth, but in fact, it's, it's not impossible. But when you put on top of that an interest rate differential, even of two percentage points, it becomes, it becomes difficult. Because if you've got even just 2% higher interest rates in Greece than you've got, say, in Germany, why would a company build a plant in Greece, where it's a bit uncompetitive anyway, and pay 2% more for its money? Of course it won't. It'll build it in Germany. And if the interest rate is a bit more than that, then, of course, even more reason to do it. Now, you start off with a situation where the problems aren't so great. but in engineering, in mathematics, you have what we call situations of unstable equilibrium. Now, imagine for a moment the inside of a sphere, the ball bearing. Ball bearing sits at the bottom of the sphere. And if you move the ball bearing, it comes back to where it began from. So it's a nice stable equilibrium. It always comes back, whatever you do, right? Now imagine the sphere with the ball bearing on the top of the sphere. There is a position in which you can balance it just. But any movement at all from that equilibrium position sends it off and there's no way of coming back. Now then, this I think applies to economics as well. After you get yourself into a situation of unstable equilibrium, there is no way back. After you get yourself in, Greece gets itself into a situation where 
the markets, the community as a whole, feel that there is no way back for Greece, there jolly well isn't. What's happened to Greece is that it has got an interest rate and a, and, and, and a currency and a competitiveness from which there is no escape. And it doesn't matter what they do. The more they struggle, the more they're going to get hooked, the more, in fact, the torture is going to increase. The unemployment rate is high already, and it's going to go up a great deal more. In the second quarter, we think GDP, we, we haven't got season adjusted data, but in fact, we think GDP fell at an annual rate of about 10%. If a, current, if, if a GDP falls at 10%, the tax revenues you collect fall at 13, 14, 15%. You can imagine what happens to, um, to um, the borrowing requirement. Not that I think the borrowing requirement is particularly important, but in fact, I, the guys out there do think it's important. And they see that borrowing requirement going higher, and they say, aha, we have to protect ourselves. The way we protect ourselves in this situation is by charging a higher interest rate in case things go wrong in Greece. And of course, by charging a higher interest rate, they make sure things do go wrong. There is absolutely no solution to this situation. You've gone too far, you've gone off the side of that sphere, and there is no solution. The amazing thing to me is that the guys out there in Europe pretend there is a solution. We've had 20-ish little summits where a bunch of clueless idiots get together and say, oh, we can solve this, all we have to do is this, this, and this. And uh, the amazing, sorry, I shouldn't be surprised at this, but the markets quite often give credibility to that solution. We go up the next day, the, the, the media BBC in particular, but the FT as well, was full of, oh, jolly good, we're going to clap our hands now because everything's going to be all right. And actually, 48 hours later, it falls to pieces again. <laughs> You'd have thought by now they'd have learned a bit of a pattern here. Yeah. Now, I myself, as I say, from the sphere analysis, think there is no solution. And even if there were a solution, I think the central bankers and the politicians in Europe are about the last set of creatures on Earth who would be capable of finding it. So, I think we should draw a line. The only solution would be for the Germans to carry on paying huge sums of money across to the Greeks, as they did to the Eastern Germans. Now, that is, I suppose, just an outside possibility. For don't forget, the Germans have a long history of doing this. The Germans did it actually for the West Berliners. And when, the, when West Berlin was in sight of trouble, um, there was an enormous transfer of funds from West Germany to West Berlin. And it took West Berlin up to a very viable economics um, um, unit. And because German, West Germany at the time was growing very quickly, it was very successful, it, the, the cost to West Germany was minimal. Hardly seemed to be felt. Okay, example number one. Then along come the Austins. They were East Germans. There's 15 million of them, and there's a lot of benefit to be given to them to bring them up to the standard. And at the time, the West Germans actually aren't growing anywhere near as quickly. But the West Germans, being the generous creatures they are, nevertheless supply the money. And for 20 years, the West Germans do this. And it costs the West Germans 20 years of negligible growth. I mean, the 20 years from 1980 to, um, 90, sorry, 1990 to, to the current time have seen an appalling um, growth in German activity, an appalling growth in German living standards. The Germans did it. Very good. Take my hat off to them. Extremely good. Will they do it for the Greeks? I suspect not. Actually, I'm not sure, I'm not even sure the Germans were all that happy about doing it for the Austrians. But in fact, I think there's very little chance of it doing it for the, um, for, for the Greeks. And for the simple reason that it was, if they did do it for the Greeks, and that would take probably a big, big depressing there, it's actually not 30 years, because um, there are probably more Greeks than there are East Germans. Um, um, uh, you, might, you might just see that as a precedent for Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Italy, France, Belgium, and so on. And can the Germans afford that? No, they jolly well can't. So, it, we have to, this, this is the end. Um, Euro is going to break up. I don't know how quickly. 
Um, and what I, and I don't know, and I'm very interested in, in what we heard this morning, I don't know whether it'll be the, the, the strong countries going out first or the weak countries going out first. Um, I think it could be either. If, if it were the self-interested um, strong guys going, that would certainly um, 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 be sensible. But if it isn't them, if they stay very generous, um, what will happen instead, I think, is that you'll have some sort of revolution. Certainly you'll have insurgency in the difficult economic circumstances of the poorer countries. And Europe is used to that, and because Europe, well, Europe, of course, pretends it subscribes to the idea of democracy, but, but doesn't. I mean, um, and, I, and I, I, I'm a French family, so I, I, I'm fairly well versed, actually. Not, not part of my DNA, by the way. This is, this is, only, this is only my sort of dozy family marrying into Britain. Uh, <laughs> but it means, in fact, I go to Paris and, and, and speak to people quite a lot. And it's very interesting. Because I would say, in fact, you guys never really understand what democracy is. Um, and they say, we should, yes, we do, yes, we do. We have lots of elections and stuff. And I say, yes, elections are one thing, but they're not the essential part of democracy. It's listening to what the people say that matters. Um, the Soviet Union used to have elections, used to get the people in, and then in fact, entirely ignore what they said, and the guys who were unelected would carry on doing what they wanted to do. And that, of course, is what Europe likes to do. And it's, it's lovely for elections, it's terrible for democracy. And when, it, when that happens, it means that the government is out of touch with the will of the people. And that's a problem. And that's why you have revolutions. If the guys who vote can't get their views across to the guys in power, the only thing they can do is to come out on the streets. I was there. I was there in the event of May and June of 68. It was magnificent. Magnificent. Um, I don't know if any of the audience were there, but I, I was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. I was chasing a girl who happened to be at the Sorbonne. I was, I was doing the graduate thing, you know, standing outside the um, lecture hall while she went in there. I found I should go in as well because they never checked. And, um, and then I'd make, um, make lewd suggestions to her during the course of the, of, of the lecture. Um, and, and then, before I knew it, everyone came out on the streets and there was this marvellous thing going on. It was absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. I've never seen such, such marvellous revolutionaries as the French had. In my day, in England, the girls who were revolutionaries would be dressed a bit more like revolutionaries and their hair would be absolutely perfect. The French revolutionary girls were just beautiful. Perfect. <laughs> Makeup, nothing as well. A tight little blouse on, leather blouse on. Fantastic. <laughs> Well-fitting jeans, high heels, and they would do the CRS. The CRS, the most frightening thing. Do you know Darth Vader is just a straight copy of the CRS? And, and the French girls would go up to them and say, Oh, oh, I hate you to pieces. You're a fascist. Have a flower. <laughs> and it, it made your legs go weak, actually. Um, because in fact it was just so exciting. But um, th this was their idea of, um, of, um, of um, democracy, because it was the only thing they could do. The, the, the De Gaulle at the time wouldn't listen to the people, so you went on the streets. In, um, in the end of the 18th century, the um, Bourbons wouldn't listen to the people, so out come the people. It's the only way when you won't listen. You've got to have some degree of democracy or you have revolution. Why the way, just on the subject, why on earth would we let the French write the constitution for Europe? I mean, what is going on here? The French manifestly write bad constitutions. They've written five republic constitutions, and, and two monarchies, three, three, three empires, each one of them worse than the last, each one of them has failed, each one of them doesn't work. When, the, the Americans had a revolution, 1789, whatever, and um, they wrote a constitution. That constitution was the most unimaginative constitution that's ever been written, because it was a straight copy of what the English had at the time, with the, except with the alteration only that, in fact, the president, the king, was elected. That's all. And it worked. It worked because, in fact, the English constitution worked at the time. The French, oh, two or three weeks later, oh, no, 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 what we have to do, 
we have to start, we have to reinvent the wheel. We, we reinvent the calendar, the months, the seasons, the days of the week. We start again from scratch. And it doesn't work. It fails immediately. And after a few weeks, you get your Stalinist Robespierre. Um, and he comes along and does the terror thing. And then, in fact, he fails as well. Then <coughs> along comes the <coughs> military dictator, um, Napoleon, who um, sets Europe on fire. And, in fact, dictator all across Europe. English have to go in, unfortunately, and um, sort it all out. But as usual happen, usual happen. But why would you let the French, who are manifest to the people who don't know how to write a constitution, how do you, why do you give the Giscard d'Estaing? Damn it, you'd give it to an Englishman who has lax imagination. That's what you should have done. <laughs> Me. <laughs> anyway, look, the situation is fairly straightforward. Um, um, Europe is in a terrible mess. Um, and it is largely the consequence of the arrogance of the people who run it. And I personally don't see any way out other than guys on the streets, revolution, um, unless, unless, belatedly, the um, Barrosos and the other guys start listening to the people. Extremely unlikely, much more likely that in fact um, we have <coughs> the upset. Um, it's a great pity we're in there, um, but it's not too late. It's not too late probably to get out. Certainly distance yourself. Get your spade and back it out and start widening the channel if you possibly can. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've spoken for far too long. Um, I think, I think it's, um, there's nothing more to say because it's so obvious, isn't it? Is it? You know, we're, we're going to, we'll, we'll probably be all right. But it would be better, I have to say, if we had, I think, a different leader. I think, I, I think, I think. Conservative Party meeting, I, um, I listen very carefully to what the, um, what the guys say, and they often make little promises and things. I say, that's very good, tremendous promise, that one. I love that promise. Now then, is that, is that a cast iron promise? <laughs> or is it one you mean to keep?